Good morning. Happy Monday. I have Neuro Coffee in hand and it is perfect as usual. Okay. A very solid Monday. Sun's out. It's going to be a great day. I'm really looking forward to it actually. And so we're going to dig into the Q&A. We got a little bit of a sort of like a client case study to go over here that I think think will be helpful. And this comes from Dory. Um, Dory says, I have a client with an ongoing sense of pressure in the left sacral area and left upper back lower cervical area when she squats. She shifts to the left when she squats, but it gets a little bit better each set, but it does persist. She's limited in end range hip flexion, but not straight leg raise, which is about 100 degrees. Hip external rotation is limited, shoulder flexion is limited on the left, but not so much on the right. She'll often complain of soreness after hinging activities in her left hamstring. Any strategy that may be helpful to alleviate the pressure in the hamstring soreness would be appreciated. Okay, so the first thing we want to do is let's deconstruct what we're actually looking at, and then we can actually come up with a, with a viable and useful strategy. So let me grab the pelvis here for a second. So, so Dory, you gave me some really, really good cues here. Um, in regards to a couple of things. So, so the left shift in the squat gives us a little bit of a, of a clue that we've got a, a, a sacrum that is going to be oriented into a right facing position. Now the question mark is, is why is that? And so the limitation in, in hip flexion gives us a little bit of a clue along with the, the straight leg raise. So the straight leg raise is, is a little bit more, more than normal so chances are we don't have this posterior or lower compressive strategy. So, so the concentric orientation here in this lower part of the pelvis below the level of the trochanter is probably not there. So we're probably still a little eccentrically oriented there. But we do have a, a, a uh, posterior compression at the sacral base. And so the giveaway there is the limited end range hip flexion. And so to, to have normal hip flexion, that full end range hip flexion, the lumbar spine has to be able to turn towards the, the hip flexing side and that sacral base needs to be able to come back on that side. So chances are you've got a compression here. And so we've got something that kind of looks like that. So, so we're pushing the sacrum. So it's pushing and facing the right, which is why she squats and shifts backwards and to the left. And, and so what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to alleviate this, this compression. So the lack of ER on this left side also reinforces the fact that you've got this compressive strategy and that's bringing the the orientation of the pelvis forward more so on the left than it is on the right. So we have kind of a unilateral issue here. Uh, both sides are affected obviously as, as they always are, but we're going to focus in on, on this left side. So the first thing that we're going to want to do is we're going to reduce this, this anterior orientation. Now, um, your client complains of, of left hamstring soreness, which is not a shocker because she's got a, a, an eccentrically oriented hamstring on this side. So when the pelvis gets pushed forward, it's oriented forward. This ischial tuberosity moves further from the, from the, uh, the femur, which means I've got eccentric orientation here. And then I've got, like I said, the, the eccentrically oriented hamstring. So every time that you put her into a hinging scenario, you've got a lot of eccentric orientation there, which is gonna increase that, that load on the hamstring. It's probably why she gets, gets sore. So what we're gonna to have to do is we're gonna to have to bring the orientation back by grabbing hold of this ischial tuberosity. Now, how do you do that? Well, we have to consider that we really want the proximal musculature of the hip to control the position of, 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 the, of the pelvis relative to the femur, but the further forward you go and the further away from the, the femur, this ischial tuberosity, the more we're gonna to have to use hamstring as an assist because if we look at this from a from a Euclidean geometric standpoint or the old school moment arms um, we lose the glute max moment arm as we flex the hip and then hamstring moment arm actually increases so we're going to use the hamstring to help us pull this back so now we're talking about hook lying activities we're looking at just your, your classic glute bridge progression if you will a couple things that you may want to consider 
under these circumstances is that if, if you do find that as she performs her glute bridge, her knees separate, we want to put something between her knees like a yoga block or a ball or, or a cat or something like that, that we can keep the knees together so we don't move into this this externally rotated position because what we're trying to do is we're trying to recapture this hip extension and as close as we get the hip extension that's more of our hip IR moment and so we don't want the knees to be to be separating under those circumstances um, but like I said you, you work from this this hip extension uh, progression to where you can get the hip fully extended and so I would refer you to an arm bar video that I did a while back where you can actually see um, the, the progression to the fully extended hip with the foot on the wall during an arm bar. So you can actually progress them towards those type of activities and then eventually bring them up to stand and, and start driving some hip extension that way. So something as simple as say a right foot step up will promote the left hip extension on the support side leg as you're stepping up. So, so things like that will be a great diagnostic for you to pay attention to as your, as your client progresses. Now, so let's take away some of the interference that, that's going on here as well. So this person is not going to be a back squatter and you're going to take away hinging activities temporarily because um, the chances of recapturing that initial tuberosity uh, position um, during a hinge is going to be, be very, very difficult because she's already having trouble. She's demonstrating trouble with that already. Um, the back squat is going to just increase the amount of, of posterior compression you've got, so we want to eliminate that. Now, what we can do though is start to use some front-loaded uh, squatting activities like a Zercher squat is on the table, a goblet squat is on the table, but what I, what I would do is elevate the heels. What we want to do is we want to move her back towards this early propulsive strategy where we're going to reduce the pressure on, on the sacral base. Um, when you put her into split activities, I would, I would elevate the front leg. Again, I want to reduce the amount of of, of load on that front leg and I want to promote that posterior expansion and the, fr the, uh, the front foot elevated sp split squat is a, is a great way to do that. Um, I would also refer you to the offset squatting activity with the heel elevated. Um, I got a video on YouTube um, for the left shift so, so that is also on the table. Now once you start to see the straight leg raise normalize and hip external rotation starts to improve, now you can start to reintroduce some, some hinging activities, but I would start with a camperini deadlift with the heel elevated. Again, what I want to do is I want to reintroduce these activities where she has to now control that ischial tuberosity relative to the femur, but I want to keep her back towards uh, a position that will reduce the sacral base uh, compression. When it comes time to reintroduce the bilateral symmetrical activities like the, those um, like a, a Romanian deadlift or, or any, anything um, that falls into that category. Um, Dory, I would use a snatch grip RDL as a reintroducing activity. The starting position uh, because of the snatch grip actually reduces the likelihood of getting that sacral base pressure that you would typically get had you used like something that would bring the hands in. Um, and, and create a compression in the upper dorsal rostral area. Um, so, so again, we just want to think about eliminating interference as much as we can. But that should give you an idea of one, what you're looking at and, and some strategy that you can use to bring this person out of this. I hope it's helpful. If you have any other questions, please let me know. Everybody have a great Monday. Let's kick off a great week and I'll see you tomorrow.